Immortalized in the classic films of Kurosawa Akira, the samurai remain one of the most iconic and compelling images in Japanese culture. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into the history of the Warring States period on a three-day trip to Gifu Prefecture, home to beautiful walking trails, fascinating local traditions, and the site of the epic battle that unified Japan, bringing centuries of warfare to a decisive end. Here's the plan. On day one, we'll begin in the historic post town of Magome, a beautifully preserved historical town on the old Nakasendo Trail. From here, we'll make our way to Seki, a city that has for centuries produced many of the best knives and swords in all of Japan, before spending the night in Gifu City. On day two, we'll take a deep dive into the history of the Warring States with a visit to Gifu Castle, before making our way to Nagaragawa Onsen. Here, we'll watch an amazing demonstration of traditional cormorant fishing before checking in for a relaxing night at a local ryokan. On our final day, we'll explore Sekigahara, site of the epic battle that finally ended the Warring States period. I'm Matt Evans, reporting for japanguide.com. Join me as we explore some of the many historic highlights of Gifu Prefecture. Day one. Our trip begins with a visit to Magome, a traditional post town on the old Nakasendo Highway. From here, we'll board a bus to Nakatsugawa Station and continue on to the city of Seki by train. From Seki Station, we'll take another bus to the Hamono Museum, where we'll learn about the craft of Japanese swordsmithing before heading to our accommodation for the night in Gifu City. In the centuries before trains and today's mass transit system, the majority of travel was done on foot via a handful of paved roads. Of these, one of the most famous and well-traveled was the Nakasendo, connecting the old capital of Kyoto with Edo, today Tokyo. Our time in Gifu begins in Magome, one of 67 post towns that once broke up the journey along the old Nakasendo. Post towns like this would have been a welcome sight for travelers like us. Something to eat, maybe a little bit of entertainment, horses to rent, and a safe place to spend the night. Today, it's best known as the starting point of one of Japan's most popular hiking routes, leading to the next post town of Tsumagojuku. Of the handful of post towns that survive today, Magome is definitely one of the best preserved. Here, rustic wooden buildings, unspoilt country views, and authentic period details add to the sense of stepping back in time. After exploring the town, we board a bus, then change to a train for Seki a city whose 800-year tradition of forging swords, knives, and cutlery have earned it the nickname City of Blades. One reason why the samurai still capture our imagination in classic movies, anime, or even video games is the unique connection between a samurai and his sword, said to contain his soul. While Japanese society may have changed almost beyond recognition, the sword remains a powerful symbol and nowhere more so than here in Seki, the home of traditional sword making with a history spanning 800 years. Located between two rivers, with good local clay and easy access to coal, Seki was blessed from the beginning with the perfect conditions for metalwork. In the Warring States period, as many as 300 sword makers were operating here. Known far and wide for their superior quality, it was often said that Seki swords don't bend, don't break, and cut well. With industrialization, demand for swords became far less. But the city continued to evolve and grow, and is now a world-class steel-forging powerhouse known for high-quality kitchen knives. At the Gifu Hamono Museum, visitors can look at up to 2,000 locally forged products or practice the basics by making a simple paper knife from recycled steel nails.
The samurai may have passed into history, but the art of sword making has endured. To find out more, we make a stop just south of Gifu City at the workshop of Asano Taro, one of 10 licensed sword makers operating in the region. A master craftsman with 25 years experience, Asano-san has taught around the world, and although we're just here for a chat, offers a range of learning experiences from one-day workshops to month-long intensive courses. で、完璧な道具なんですよ。えっと、作り方も完璧だし、見た目も完璧だし、作る理論も完璧なんですよ。もう火の打ち所が一個もないぐらい完璧なんですよ。で、完璧に動かせば完璧に何でも切れるんです
Today, the six local Usho are employed by the Imperial Household Agency, which looks after the Emperor and his family. Day three. For the last day of our trip, we're leaving Nagaragawa Onsen behind and making our way by bus and train to Sekigahara, site of one of Japan's greatest and most decisive battles. In a military career spanning 30 years, the warlord Oda Nobunaga greatly expanded his territory, becoming by far the most powerful man in all of Japan. But in 1582, he was assassinated, leaving his dreams of a unified Japan unfulfilled. It fell to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, a man who had risen from humble origins to become Nobunaga's most trusted associate, to avenge his death and continue his work. Hideyoshi succeeded in bringing the country under control, but when he too passed away in 1598, the ambitious warlord Tokugawa Ieyasu began to seize power, setting him and his allies on a collision course with samurai still loyal to Hideyoshi's clan. In 1600, Ieyasu marched his army north to fight the rebellious Uesugi clan. His enemies chose this moment to raise their own army, hoping to block Ieyasu on his journey home. Led by Ishida Mitsunari, the so-called Western Army made their stand here at Sekigahara. Today, visitors can dive into the history and events of the battle at the Gifu Sekigahara Battlefield Memorial Museum, located just beside the site of Tokugawa Ieyasu's final encampment. Making our way inside, we start with ground vision. From this detailed display below our feet, we can get a sense of the sheer scale of the battlefield and a clear picture of how events unfolded. Next is the theatre. Here, an innovative curved screen combined with immersive wind, vibration and sound effects puts you in the thick of the action. From here, we make our way up to the exhibition room with impressive displays of weapons, armor, and other artifacts. In the Sengoku Experience Corner, visitors can handle weapons or pose for the camera in period dress, just like the samurai on that fateful day. On the uppermost floor is the observation deck and a spectacular panoramic view of the battlefield. After checking out the museum's attractions, it's time to head out and explore some of the surrounding historical sites by e-bike. Early in the morning, the first of the Tokugawa troops made their encampment here. Around 8 a.m., a great beacon was lit, and just like that, the battle for the future of Japan had begun. From the east came the Tokugawa army, led by Ieyasu himself. The Western army under Ishida Mitsunari had already taken their positions here on Mount Sasao. At around 8 a.m., an eerie mist that had hidden the two sides from one another suddenly lifted. Soon, shots rang out and the Eastern Army surged forward. As fighting began in earnest, it was still the Western side that appeared stronger. But unbeknownst to Mitsunari, there was already trouble brewing in the ranks. More a politician than a warrior, Mitsunari had never quite earned the respect of his allies. As fighting began, some of his orders fell on deaf ears, leaving whole sections of the army out of his control. And then there was Ieyasu's secret weapon, a storm of letters offering land and titles to any Western commander willing to switch sides. One of several generals planning to do just that was Kobayakawa Hideaki. But as the critical moment approached, he froze. Mitsunari had suspected that the young general Kobayakawa Hideaki might switch sides. That's why he placed him at what he hoped was a safe distance on Mount Matsuo. At around 11 a.m. under heavy attack, Mitsunari sent up a flare, the prearranged signal for an all-out attack by the Western Army. But at this critical moment, it soon became clear that some of his most important commanders were nowhere to be seen. 
With Kobayakawa still not budging from his position on the mountaintop, Ieyasu moved his command post forward to this position. From here, his soldiers were able to fire a volley of warning shots, finally forcing the young general to make a choice. At last, Kobayakawa brought his forces down the mountain and into his own side, collapsing the Western army in a devastating chain reaction. The battle was over. One of the most decisive engagements in Japanese history, the Battle of Sekigahara effectively brought the period of warring states to a close, ushering in the Tokugawa dynasty, who would rule unopposed for 260 years. We'll never know exactly how many died here at Sekigahara, although the number must be in the tens of thousands. The heads of fallen warriors from both sides were interred here at the Higashi Kubizuka, where services in their memory are still said to this day. From old post towns to the mysteries of sword making, cormorant fishing to the scene of one of Japan's greatest battles, it's been a fascinating three days packed with local color and historical detail. I hope you found some inspiration here for your next trip. For more information about this trip or to watch another video, click the links on your screen now or head over to japanguide.com, your comprehensive, up to date travel guide firsthand from Japan. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell for more videos about Japan. Happy travels!